Lightweight's audience, today we have a very special guest. We are going to be learning so much about business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. We have the former CEO of Blockbuster and 7-Eleven, Jim Keyes. Joe, thank you for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. Blockbuster was such a monumental piece of pop culture and history, and everyone grew up going there, and you were the CEO of the company. I was. It was a privilege, I got to tell you, to, to lead two iconic companies like 7-Eleven and Blockbuster. Um, man, I've got some stories. Yes. I mean, your entire <laughs> journey of just business and everything is so inspiring because you started from the bottom and worked your way up. And like, I did. Here you are. I did. You know, it, it, it's kind of cliche, but the American dream really is a thing and it, it's real. I mean, I literally grew up, you know, one of six kids with too little money and, you know, not enough not enough hope into the future, but for some reason, and for me, it was education that uh, made all the difference, and uh, it changed my life. Where'd you go to school? A little public school called, uh, it started in Grafton, Massachusetts, and then I went to Millbury, Massachusetts, but I was a public school kid, uh, got into Holy Cross for a college, and then on to Columbia for graduate school. What kind of partying goes on at Columbia? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I was one of those kids that was like, uh oh, I got here. I better stay head down, you know? So I, I didn't really didn't party much. Is the workload there? Because it's Ivy League, right? Yeah. Constant work. Yeah. It's pretty, it's a pretty serious environment. And, you know, particularly graduate school, I mean, undergrad, I'm sure Columbia College is a lot more fun because everybody's on campus and it's a great campus environment. But graduate school, I think, is a lot more serious and people are, you know, ready to move on with their career and, you know, get their serious learning, get a set of tools to to employ in the real world. And uh, so, yeah, it was but it was still fun. I, got, I can't say it wasn't fun. I had a great group of friends and you We're went still there friends today. Did you go there for business? I did. Graduate school of business. Yep. Wow. Got an MBA. Cool. Can we dive into Blockbuster? Absolutely. Let's go. First thing everybody says, why? Why did you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Because you went in toward the end of it when it was... I did. 2007. It, the, the company was... Uh, Netflix was already around. Uh, in fact, this rumor that uh, we could have you know, bought Netflix, that happened in the year 2000, as I understand it. Way before I got there. Seven years before I arrived. And, uh, and Netflix was still just a fledgling, you know, they had an idea and they did a, a really nice job with the idea of DVDs by mail. But it was nothing that Blockbuster couldn't do themselves, which they ultimately did. They created a, a DVD my, by mail program. There's much more versatility where you can go return the DVDs. You don't have to pay. They did. It was called Total Access. Right. Um, so you could you could get DVDs by mail if you didn't like, if you ordered by some chance, you know, Paul Blart Mall Cop or some stupid thing that you said, why did I order that? You could take it to the Blockbuster store and exchange it for something you didn't want to see. Did the origin of the movie rental business start because movie companies were selling the movies for $100 a piece? Yeah, it, it, it originated back in the in the early days, uh, you know, back in the day, of course, we all used to go to the cinema and that was the big window of opportunity for the studios to make money because people went to the movies. And then VHS came out and uh, they were very expensive initially and uh, it was not practical for people to think that they could afford to buy these movies. So the rental business started, in fact, 7-Eleven, believe it or not, when I was there, started a, a, a thing called Movie Quick. I, people forget this now. What we missed that Blockbuster had, ironically, was great technology. Now, Blockbuster still, when I got there, had that same technology. It was COBOL-based Fortran and COBOL, believe it or not. Uh, but it was basically an inventory management system that let them keep track of the VHS tapes. 7-Eleven tried doing the movie rental? 7-Eleven got into it. It was called Movie Quick. We had one whole row of movies in uh, in a number of stores, test stores. I think it started in Dallas. And uh, and the problem with 7-Eleven, it was just an ancillary business. It was, you know, 7-Eleven gets into anything that customers want conveniently. So it made sense in the beginning but the technology that was required for it to be successful was way beyond what 7-Eleven had, the capabilities of doing at the time. So and we couldn't, we just couldn't compete. Were people going into 7-Eleven getting it behind the counter type of thing? Yeah. What you'd do is you'd go up to the, to the uh, counter, uh, to, the, to the rack where we had a, probably, I think we had 30 or 40 movies on display. And you would pick a movie and take the card up to the counter and the person behind the counter would fill the 
uh, the DVD case and and hand over the movie. Now the problem was, and this will get back. We're probably going to talk to late to, about late fees. I'm guessing at some point. <laughs> that is a question. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. <laughs> but that was the problem at 7-Eleven because we didn't have a way to keep track or to charge late fees, and so it was kind of like people would rent these movies and they'd never bring them back. And of course, you know, we'd be out of you know a, a very expensive VHS tape. So bottom line is 7-Eleven tried, it wasn't successful. It was a technology issue that kept 7-Eleven uh, from being successful in the movie quick business is what they called it. Um, and Blockbuster prevailed. Uh, they ended up with uh, five, 6,000 stores and uh, I think they were in uh, 10 countries, 12 countries, something like that worldwide. The reason Blockbuster rose is because they offered so many of those new releases. They cut a deal of rev sharing with the movie studios. Yeah. Boy, you've done your research. Yeah. Uh, the studios, uh, particularly when DVDs came out. Now, people think Blockbuster didn't keep up with technology. They did quite well in making the transition from VHS to DVDs because no one knew that new technology. And We forget today that DVDs, there was beta, there was high def. There were different forms of DVDs as well. So it was tremendously complicated, but they made the transition. The studios then came up with a, a thing called revenue sharing because remember the studios used to make money in the theater and now all of a sudden they were making a lot of money in the rental business, but they wanted a share of that. So they got a cut of it. So they got a cut of it. Yeah. Do you know the split? Uh, I don't remember. And, and, it, and it differed over the years. It changed uh, somewhat over the years. But, but the studios had a strong incentive in keeping Blockbuster healthy and alive because they made almost as much, in some cases more, in the DVD rental window than they did in the cinema window. And that's where the whole straight to DVD really thrived. Exactly. Exactly. Did they have that same kind of rev split with video games? Uh, video games, it was a similar, but, it, but, but different because the video games were much more fragmented with a whole lot of different video game companies. Uh, so that was a different challenge for Blockbuster at the time. Rewind fees and late fees. Yeah. Was rewind fee really a thing? Yeah. I don't know. Rewind was way before me. That was in the old VHS days, but remember be kind rewind. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think that was a challenge for the company back in the day. Uh, but late fees were a pretty important part of the business model. And, you know, people don't think of it from the company's perspective, but if you bought, you know, we're now in the DVD world. So let's say you bought from the studios a new release for $15. And now um, it really wasn't a problem. They had great credit terms with the studios, didn't have to pay for that for about 90 days. Well, you could rent that movie 20 times before you ever had to pay for it. So it was great cash flow. But if someone didn't bring that back, now you disappointed the next customer that wanted to see the new release or had to buy more copies. And if they didn't bring it back until two months later, now it's not a new release anymore. When Blockbuster had like 100 copies, right. what did they do with those extras once the kind of the buzz died? Well, they would uh, either sell them or, or put them in the shelf, you know, as sort of the older movies. Because, you know, the, the new releases ended up being about 80% of volume uh, of the revenue uh, for Blockbuster. People always wanted to go to that new release mo uh, wall. Believe it or not, they had a, a quirky strategy. And, and I, I, it was sort of like uh, designed um, uh, disappointment. I, it's like, I remember hearing that when I first arrived at the company. It's like, what? And it was like a planned disappointment for the customers. So they'd come in and they wouldn't find the new release. And that would cause them to want to come back again to get it next week or the next night. Now, that worked. That, all that worked fine when Blockbuster was the only game in town. But when they had competitors like Netflix or Redbox, if you're disappointing the customer all the time, it was easier just to go online and get it by mail or go to Redbox at Walmart. So that strategy didn't work. We actually changed it and, and filled the new release wall, and it worked. In the year 2008, my first year, full year uh, with the company, we had a dramatic increase in sales and profits. We doubled, uh, tripled profit, net profit, and, and doubled EBITDA, our cash flow, during that one period of time just from improving um, the customer satisfaction at the stores. Did you go into a lot of blockbusters at the time to get that experience? 
I did. I did. It was a different model when I joined the company. You know, there was a lot of uh, skepticism. People said, well, he's a stores guy. Well, I wasn't a stores guy. I was a convenience guy. And the point is, you know, convenience is all about having what the customers want, when they want it, where they want it. Well, that lent itself very nicely to Blockbuster because Blockbuster wasn't in the DVD rental business. They were in the convenient access to media entertainment business. If they were in the rental business, they would have, you know, uh, gone long, gone away a long time before. But they recognized that they were in the business of satisfying customers' desire for media entertainment. That means they had to evolve to digital over time. The question was when and how. Right. And was that your plan going into it? Because you came from 7-Eleven, which was a convenience right. business. So did they see you as the guy to bring that to the table? They did. And, and here's, well, the board did. And, and, and here's how that came to be. We, uh, I had approached the company. I was actually trying to buy Blockbuster. Um, I had talked to private equity. I had a deck that had a strategy in it for taking Blockbuster private because we knew that the transformation to digital would be hard. It would be expensive. We had a billion dollars of debt at the time. Blockbuster had that. Blockbuster had okay. that, yeah, which came from Viacom when they were a public company, and then they spun them out in 2004, I think it was, and they put a billion dollars of debt on the balance sheet, which was fine. It, it, the company could handle it. It had plenty of cash flow. But that billion dollars of debt by 2009 was a backbreaker. Had we refinanced the company with private equity in 2007, when I got there, we would have sailed right through the financial crisis of 2009 and Blockbuster would still be around today, I'm convinced. Um, but we didn't. We kept it public. I joined the company. They talked me into joining. Instead of taking it private, we left it a public company. If I had anything to do over, that would be number one. Take it private, refinance it, do what we needed to do, and then reemerge as a public company later on. But we didn't. So we kept it, we kept it a public company. And by 2009, the financial crisis was in full bloom. So in spite of making big, big changes strategically to compete digitally, number one being acquisition of a company called MovieLink. We bought a streaming video company, the be arguably the best at the time. Better uh, than Netflix. Better than Netflix at the time. And here's why. Uh, the studios created their own streaming video company. MovieLink. MovieLink. Yeah, uh, it was five of the six major studios, Sony, Warner, Paramount, they all got together and said, we don't want to lose control of this valuable intellectual property. We're gonna create a company and we'll stream ourselves. Now the idea was great, but they're fierce competitors. It'd be like Coke and Pepsi saying, hey, we're gonna come together and, you know, <laughs> and share a distribution system. They'd be like, you know, eh, maybe not so much. Yeah. Right? So they came together, they created this entity called MovieLink, and it was it had 3,000 titles, mostly new releases, or relatively new releases. They had more streaming content than anybody in the marketplace at the time. This is really early, 2007. What did you stream it on, just a computer? Well, this is part of the problem, yeah. 2007, to put that in context, the iPhone was launched in 2007. People were talking about who's going to watch a movie on that little itty bitty screen. The iPad didn't come out until 09. And TVs, smart TVs, didn't come out until later. So there were really very few options for streaming video other than probably the most popular at the time was Xbox. And then uh, Roku came out and created a box that would let you stream. And we came out with a box that let you stream. But it was a very, very clunky slow, uh, not a good consumer proposition. And Buffering. you would download the Movie Link app correct, to it? Correct, correct. Yeah, the Movie Link app would either be on the box or, or you could download to it. Um, one of our challenges was getting into the devices to be able to load because Apple, of course, was a competitor. They wanted their own app and they wanted to stream their own movies. Uh, so yeah, it was quite a challenging time. Do you in, remember in the, the cost per month for the user on Movie Link? Um, Movie Link was a different model than the Netflix model. It was on demand. So just like the stores, you want to see a movie, it'd be $4.99, $5.99 to rent a movie. Um, versus the subscription model that Netflix had, 
uh, for DVDs by mail and for their uh, streaming service, which was great. But think about the script subscription model. It's kind of like the, the all-you-can-eat buffet, right? Yeah. It's a lot of food. And if you're really hungry, you can get a lot of stuff. But is it the best? No, you probably want to order off the menu for the for the for the for the New York strip, right? Yeah. That's the difference between the subscription model for movies on demand or for movies, long tail movies, older movies, and the on demand model, which is I want to see Top Gun. The studios just spent seven hundred million dollars to produce it. They're not going to throw it in the all you can eat buffet for a year or two. This episode is sponsored by Heineken Zero Zero. If you don't know, it's an alcohol-free option to the original Heineken you love. If you're getting sick of the juice, the soda, the water, well, Heineken Zero Zero might be for you. It still has 100% taste, but 0.0% alcohol. That means it's perfect for all the times you want a beer, but might not want the alcohol. I know a lot of you are giving up alcohol for dry January, and I'm here with you. Let's do this together. So if you're still going out with the boys, you're hanging out with the girls, you're trying to still have fun, try Heineken Zero Zero. It has 100% the taste, 0.0% alcohol, and my favorite part, it's only 69 calories, baby. Sure doesn't taste like it. So check my link in the description. You must be 21 plus to purchase, and please enjoy Heineken responsibly. And for real, if anyone wanted to do Dry January, maybe you didn't have a friend or a partner to do it, shoot me a message, I'm gonna do it with you. I'm responding to everybody. Huge shout out to Heineken Zero Zero. Dry January. Let's do this. Do you think that Movie Link then just came before its time because it wasn't accessible? That's Movie why Link. it failed? Movie Link was very much before it time, its time. Uh, it, it was hard to get to it. Uh, Wi-Fi was not very robust. And did you guys know this at the time? Like, oh, yeah. <sighs> Absolutely. So it's one of those things. As a, as a, as a, as a, a business person, I don't care if you're an entrepreneur or running a you know, multi-billion dollar company, you have to tough decisions on the timing of your investment. So do you invest today in something that it may be five or six years before the consumer experience is good enough for it to be really mainstream? Because that was the other issue. You guys didn't know when 5G was coming out. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and let's face it, 5G just came out. Oh. And in fact, Dish ultimately bought the company. Dish had the plan to go straight to mobility because they thought that being able to load movies on your phone and then download them to any device would be a far better solution than, than the, the clunky streaming that we had with Wi-Fi back in the day. But the key was we weren't yet to 5G. Right. They anticipated it coming much, much sooner than it ultimately did. Were the heads of Blockbuster worried about Netflix at the time when it was starting to grow? You know, Blockbuster never really worried about Netflix in the sense that if you, again hindsight's 2020 you know you can easily say wow you should have been <laughs> well yeah but netflix at the time had dvds by mail it was a great business but it was longer tail older movies for a subscription price blockbuster in comparison at the time had total access so dvds by mail yeah we got it but we can give you new releases too by mail and you want to come into the store and exchange something we've got stores that let you exchange and you want kiosks we've got that and you want Streaming on demand movies, we got that. Were the kiosks like red, red box? Yeah, yeah, they were blue. Oh, that's what it was called, blue. <laughs> yeah, well, no, they were they were called Blockbuster, but they were, <laughs> they, were they were blue boxes. Yeah, yeah. were you at 7 Eleven at the time Red Box came into all the 7 Elevens? Uh, no, I had already left. Yeah, oh. yeah, they they got there uh, after my departure. Yeah, um, but they made sense, you know, uh, put it out on the dock. It's a convenience item. Again, it's it's any any way to satisfy the customer with more convenient access to what they want fit the 7-Eleven model perfectly. And ironically, it also fit the Blockbuster model. We were just a bit early. Right. One of the most interesting things that I heard was that Google was looking into buying Blockbuster. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, you talk about missed opportunities. Oh man, I'd love to have that one back. Um, <laughs> that wasn't quite true in that form. They weren't looking to buy Blockbuster. They were looking to collaborate with Blockbuster. We recognized that we were, we were the best name worldwide in access to movie content. What we didn't have is the technology platform, nor did Netflix. They had a great search engine and an ordering engine, but they didn't really have the platform at the time 
to have a great customer experience. Well, Google would have been a great partner. And if you think about what Google had, YouTube, all free content. We were going to be side by side, YouTube free, anything that was movie at all, production related, theater related, studio related, would be blockbuster. Side by side, YouTube free, blockbuster, you know, paid. We could charge for trailers. We could charge for full movies. We could have TV. We could have, um, you know, old movies, new movies. It was an, a total access, truly aggregator of content, just like the stores. And that deal, what so Google was going to be our collaboration partner. We worked on it for several months. The you were head was, of the company at this time? I was. Whoa. Was, yeah, and, and we were excited about it. So, you know, now, meanwhile, the world is collapsing around us. So Lehman Brothers collapsed. The banks were shut down. Studios were in a panic. They were saying, oh, my gosh, you're going to be able to refinance your debt. We had $300 million of debt due in 2009. So the world's collapsing around us. Is that the movie revenue split coming back and all the store debt? No, it was, this was a billion dollars of debt on the balance sheet from the old Viacom days when they spun the company into a public company. Yeah. It had a billion dollars of debt, but a third of it due in 2009. So all of this chaos is swirling around us in the financial world, which people have short memories. They forget what happened. The banks were virtually shut down. They weren't lending anybody any money. And Google, the Google deal was really the, the, the ultimate solution to be able to compete in the streaming world long term. We already owned MovieLink, so it was a perfect complement for Google. Um, the deal went to my board. My board loved it. They were all signed up. The definitive agreement was literally with Google's board and management team. And I believe it was the LA Times that broke a story that was not true. They said, Blockbuster is about to file bankruptcy. And I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Saw this story come out, and I got the call from a guy named Nagesh Aurora at, uh, at Google. And he, he was the lead on this project. He was a very senior guy at Google. And he said, Jim, I'm sorry to tell you. We're not going to be able to follow through until you guys get on the other side of your financial difficulties. And he said, I'll never forget, he said, and Jim, I got to warn you, in Google time, that, that could be 100 years from now. We're going <laughs> to, we, we move fast, and I don't know if we'll be around to, to be able to do this later on. Oh, no. So we missed a, a fabulous opportunity. Was the LA Times article just coincidence? It was um, speculation. They were speculating on what likely could happen if Blockbuster couldn't refinance its debt. And, um, you know, there was a fair amount of that speculation going around at the time. Uh, I ended up in um, the New York Post, uh, half page, full color picture with a Pinocchio nose. I was like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you haven't lived until your buddies call you from New York where you went to school. Hey, Keys, have you opened the post this morning? No, I live in Dallas now. Well, you're in there with a Pinocchio nose. <laughs> you're like, really? <laughs> Come on. Because I had been saying there's no need for Blockbuster to file bankruptcy. And there wasn't. We had very strong cash flow. We had, as I mentioned, we doubled our cash flow in the year 2008. So by the third quarter, of 2008, the company was really in very solid financial condition. But with the inability to refinance that debt, it was going to be increasingly difficult for us if we couldn't find a solution for that refinancing. The studios then ultimately were scared by that and said, we don't want to be the ones, you know, hanging out there with oh, you know, Blockbuster OAS money, so we're going to put you on cash terms. Well, that one decision by the first studio that led to the second, the third, the fourth sucked $300 million of cash out of the Blockbuster system because now all of a sudden we had to pay for the movies the day we bought them rather than wait 90 days when we had the, the, the ability to rent them first. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. There's a huge lesson here, though, huge lesson for entrepreneurs. Change is critically important. And yes, you have to adapt to change, but cash flow is your oxygen. And careful management of cash flow is a critical element of any business, whether it's a small company, uh, family business, 
or a billion dollar company. That critical management of day in, day out cash flow is the, uh, is the oxygen that you need to survive. What was the biggest cash flow? The movie rentals? The movie rentals, yeah. Blockbuster Still the new like releases? Cash flow business, yeah. Mostly 80% new releases and, uh, and the ability to buy those uh, rentals and then have 90 days before you had to pay for them. So we would rent a movie and, and, and it would be cash flow positive before we ever had to even pay for it. So Blockbuster was a very, very good business at the time. And they were still selling it to you at a discount, correct? So they weren't... At a bit of a discount, yeah. Right. Yeah, versus what you would find on the street. Now, the other challenge is you had companies like Walmart out there that would sell it at a loss to be able to draw people in. It's, a, it's called a loss leader at retail. Because they're trying to get people to buy other stuff in Walmart. Yeah, yeah. So believe it or not, I'm out there buying DVDs for like, 13 14 15 dollars and Walmart would be selling them for 9.99 <laughs> to the customers. Now of course we couldn't as Blockbuster go in the Walmart stores and buy them. Redbox did, believe it or not. It was actually part of Redbox's model to buy DVDs they from had, they Walmart. Had, they had an army of people out there going into Walmart and buying them five at a time and then putting them in the machines at a lower cost of goods than Blockbuster. That's crazy. I know, I know. It was, uh, you know, it was very creative. It was a very entrepreneurial approach. I never would have thought it would work. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But, yeah. Uh, but they did, and they figured out they had, you know, thousands of machines out there that they were replenishing with new releases in that fashion. When you hear something like that, as you being CEO, are you kind of just like, we can't compete? Like, what are we supposed to do? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little challenging, but you know, it's, uh, as CEO, it's what you deal with. You deal with aggressive competition and it's day in, day out. That's business. That's the nature of business. Somebody comes up with a better way to do something. It's like, okay, great. You know, they're nimble. They can do that. We have such scale. We have the inability to replenish all of our stores in that fashion. So, okay. Competitive advantage for a small period of time. Redbox, right. um, but you have to find other ways to compete. Hence, total access. Let's make it more convenient for people. And uh, and you know, frankly, Redbox skimmed off a little bit of the occasional user, but it didn't really hurt Blockbuster in a big way. Did you have access to celebrities to leverage promotions at Blockbuster? We did, we did. We had uh, from time to time, you know, uh, to promote movies and. Uh, uh, we worked very closely with the studio, so we did things like when the Indiana Jones movie came out, we had an indie car all dressed in the Indiana Jones, you know, uh, images, and uh, it was great. We had we had a lot of fun with it. Nowadays, movies almost come out weeks after their release. How come it took months for movies to come out years ago? Well, the, the studios are still very protective of their windows, and they have to because, you know, from a customer's perspective, it's like, well, why don't they just let us see it now? I want to see, you know, the new Barbie. Eh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. But if you wanted to see the new Barbie, you wouldn't want to have to wait for the window, right? Because um, it used to be like 90 days, sometimes six months. Exactly. But think again about, go back to the studio's profitability. They made, they spend million hundreds of millions of dollars to make these movies they have to protect that theater window so that customers can still go to the movies pay the premium to see it and that provides the studios with the revenue to to pay down a lot of that investment in that movie and the bigger the box office the bigger their return on that movie then they can slide into the next window where they don't make as much as they make at the theater uh, by allowing it to stream or in the old days allowing it to be rented DVDs and then after that they would allow it to be you know sent to other venues right yeah. and the subscription model for example after it goes through the cinema window then the DVD or now streaming window uh, then they can throw it into the all you can eat subscription bin right if Blockbuster was still around during the pandemic, do you think it would have thrived or would have not succeeded? I think if Blockbuster was around during the pandemic, it would have done fabulously well. Um, and, you know, candidly, I, I, I think we would have withstood 
the challenges of Netflix, of Apple, of all of the other players in the business because Blockbuster was that aggregator. And that was our strategy, to be that aggregator. It doesn't exist today. You want to see a specific movie? Where do you go? It's so hard. It's hard, yeah. Do you think there will ever be a big company like an umbrella that you can just watch any movie under? I think there will. I think um, right now we're in that fierce battle between all the networks, all the networks, and Apple and 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 Peacock, Max, Netflix, and Hulu, App, and yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's very fragmented now. But ultimately, the consumer wants convenience, and they want to be able to go to one place where they have access. I think what you'll see long term is two or three players surface that are the aggregators. And those are just going to be Google or Apple, because who else has that power? Very likely, very likely. In fact, I get trashed uh, on a on a comment I made in a, an investor shareholder meeting <laughs> years and years ago. It's still out there on the internet. And it's like, oh man, I read this and it's like, no, no, it's out of context. They go, well, Jim Keyes said Netflix is not the competition, and then they stop the quote, right? <laughs> and then, of course, the, the commentary is, but look at Netflix market cap today and blah, blah, blah. And so, and Blockbuster's out of business, therefore Jim Keyes is an idiot, <laughs> right? And what they forget is the next part of the line. I said, Netflix is not the competition. Apple, Google, and I may have mentioned Walmart at the time because they were into streaming at the time, is the greater competition for the long term. And I still believe that that longer term, uh, there will be that aggregation. Netflix could prevail, but it's a it's a tough, tough business. And I think the the players with deeper pockets, like the Apple, like the Googles, uh, will have a better chance to succeed in that aggregator role long term. Do you know how many employees you had at the most when you were CEO? Wow, it depends. Uh, for Seven Eleven, it was like four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand. Uh, Blockbuster similar amount because we didn't have as many franchise stores that doesn't count the franchisees um, if you looked at it as including franchisees you'd say there could be as many as a million employees in any given time uh, quite challenging how did you keep your leadership to trickle all the way down to the store clerk of whatever your philosophy was yeah you know I took a chapter out of Sam Walton's playbook um, Sam when he built Walmart, recognized the importance of communication throughout the organization. And he was frustrated by the inability to get directly to that store manager. So Sam, for many, many years, would fly everyone into Bentonville. They called it the, the Walmart Air Force. They had small planes, little twin engine planes. And all of these leaders from all over the country would come to Bentonville, Arkansas. And on Saturdays, every Saturday, he would have a meeting. And he would talk to all of the people across the country every Saturday. Well, it worked to a large extent, helping keep Walmart true to its mission uh, at every store throughout the country. Seeing that model, I recognized we couldn't do that, but we had the power of technology. So we employed for 7-Eleven, for example, the very first national telecommunications network where I was able to once a week talk to every literally every store, but we generally stop at markets and talk to every market manager. And then we evolved from telecom to video conferencing. Very first, I think we had the largest video conference link at some point nationwide for 7-Eleven talking to all of the employees. And I would once a week talk about, here's the three priorities for this week. Yeah. It's fabulous. You know what? Here's the example I use. Remember, have you ever played that game called Telephone? Yeah. Yeah, as a kid. We did it around a campfire, right? And you whisper something in someone's ear, and it goes around the circle, and then it comes back, and you go, ha, 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 that's a funny, it's just ridiculous, it's not even close to what I said, right? <laughs> By the time it circulates through 10 or 12 different people, that's management. Management's the same thing. Between me and the store, there were like 10 or 12 layers of management. So I could tell my senior staff, here's the strategy. This is what I want to do this week. And it could be the best strategy in the world. Could be fabulous, yeah. By the time it gets filtered 12 different times through different manager you know, reporting uh, priorities, then you never know what's going to come out on the other end. Yeah. 
How do you think you would have done on a show like Un- Undercover Boss? <laughs> I had the opportunity. Actually. You passed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I passed. I passed. It came out. First of all, at 7-Eleven, I never could have done it because I was in the stores all the time. And I was doing these these weekly oh, videos. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody was like, I don't care what kind of disguise you could have put on me. I, I think they would have, they would have uh, seen through it. Uh, Blockbuster, I was relatively new, but we had our hands full. And so Blockbuster, they approached me to do Undercover Boss, but I was like... Guys, we had, we got to fix this thing first. We were we were fighting from the day I walked in the door. Yeah, for our survival. Why do you think the last blockbuster in Bend, Oregon, survived? One of my favorite quotes is a Calvin Coolidge quote, and it's about persistence and determination. And uh, that store manager in Bend, Oregon, is persistent and determined. <laughs> She literally would not take no for an answer when they said, we're going to close your stores. No, you're not. And did everything in her power, ultimately going to Dish, who had acquired the company. What do you mean going to Dish? She went to senior management at Dish and said, I want to keep my store open. (laughs) I want to license it, a separate license. And they they ultimately granted it to her uh, because she was out there. She was out there with so much social media and publicity and, and just nurturing that you know, that wonderful loyalty that the Blockbuster brand would evoke. Have you ever been to it? Yeah, I haven't. I need to. <laughs> I really need to get up there and visit. But she's a character. Was I, at the time, I was a kid, so I didn't really know. Was there an 18 plus section at Blockbuster? Um, I, I don't know if it was a... 18 plus section specifically, but they did have more mature movies, R rated, some R rated movies, but it was always a very delicate thing because we were really a, we were a family business for the most part. Right. Yeah. It was always delicate. That was always a rumor as a kid. Yeah. Did you go behind the curtain? Oh, no. no, no, no. <laughs> Not that I know of. It could have been some franchise stores, but. Were there any good perks that you enabled for the employees, like free movies to try and keep morale up in the stores? Yeah, there were a lot of over the years, a lot of things, um, benefits from, you know, whether it's uh, being able to see movies or new releases, you know, sooner or whatever, you know, uh, it's it's always important to have the employees feel like they're part of the team and 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 make them make them feel like they're, you know, they're part of the solution. Um, and that's a challenge. Candidly, with that many employees, it, it, it is really a challenge to keep morale up, especially when the company is going through financial difficulties. Do you thrive in that environment of the high stakes, high, high stress? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, kind of. Yeah. Um, going back to 7-Eleven, uh, people forget that 7-Eleven went bankrupt in 1991. While you were CEO? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no. No, although if you read some of my social media feeds, it'll sound like that, but no. No, absolutely not. We, uh, I, I arrived at the company, and about five or six years later, they did a big leverage buyout, took the company private, and it ended up in bankruptcy by 1991. Yeah, and um, it it ended up being a good thing because sometimes you need to have a crisis to reinvent yourself. And 7-Eleven reinvented itself. I had the good fortune of coming out of that bankruptcy as the head of planning for 7-Eleven and we created a whole new business plan focused around change and creating new products and and uh, taking a lesson from our international licensees that were fabulous 7-Eleven stores. Um, so yeah, we did. And we, we ended up with a great run. By the time I was CEO, we had, uh, 40 quarters of improved same store sales and, uh, 40 quarters. Yeah. Yeah. 10 years, which for retailers is unheard of. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, we had a huge increase in earnings. The stock was, went up 10 times, went from four to 40. Um, so we had a good run, really good run at Seven Eleven, And that environment demonstrated to me that, that it's not the change that matters. Because we went through some horrible change, you know, facing a bankruptcy and an LBO environment. The market collapsed for the, on them when they were trying to do their LBO. It's not the change that matters. It's the response to change. It worked for me personally, worked for me professionally, and it worked for 7-Eleven to help them reinvent themselves. So now they have 80,000 stores worldwide. How'd you work your way up in the company? Where'd you start and where'd you, obviously you ended off at CEO. Yeah, I started, believe it or not, in the gasoline business. I had started my career with Gulf Oil. Right out of college. Well, right out of grad school. Grad yeah. school. They hired me for an internship, and I just I was starving to death, so I needed a job. And uh, I ended up at Gulf 
um, then uh, went to uh, uh, Gulf merged with Chevron. So I had this big merger and I was about to move to San Francisco where Chevron's headquarters was. Were you in New York at the time? I was in, um, uh, Gulf was in Pittsburgh, okay. Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I, and I actually, uh, for a short period of time with Gulf moved to New York, uh, New Jersey, right across the river from New York. Oh, really? What yeah. part? I was in, uh, uh, right outside of Alpine, a small town called Cloister. Just I went, to, I went to school at Montclair in North Jersey. Okay. Yeah. But I'm yeah, from the East coast. Bergen County. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was there for a while. Um, and, uh, ended up, uh, during the merger, I had the opportunity to jump to the Southland Corporation. 7-Eleven had just acquired Sitco Petroleum. To have 7-Elevens at the gas stations. Correct. To have gasoline at the 7-Eleven stations. Yeah. <laughs> Close. <Right. laughs> and so uh, they invited me to come in and, and help them with a turnaround uh, of that operation and integrate it into 7-Eleven, which I did. We were able to sell the company then to the Venezuelans, keep a long-term supply contract for 7-Eleven stores. And uh, they asked me to stay with 7-Eleven to lead the gasoline business. So I was I was a kid. I can't believe they entrusted me with this entire retail gasoline operation. But and you were in that sector, and then you moved up several positions, correct? Yeah, it was actually during the leverage buyout that I was leading the gasoline business. And we had models. We had all these financial models, projections and everything. And the stores were projecting big sales increases during the LBO they actually had declining sales. What is the LBO? Uh, leverage buyout. Sorry. Yeah. In other words, you buy a company, uh, take it private. It was a public company. The management restructured it. Restructured, took it private, put $4 billion of debt on 7 Eleven at 16% interest. Yeah. It was, it's mind boggling to think that that could happen. But, but it did. I mean, those are those times very similar to what happened to blockbuster you know those those two financial periods 1987 was a market collapse black monday um you hear about and then again the market collapsed in 2008 and both of those companies had severe repercussions 7-eleven was able to come out of that and prevail it was it forced them into bankruptcy but coming out of bankruptcy they had a better business model going forward and uh, Blockbuster, unfortunately, uh, restructured, sold out of bankruptcy to Dish Networks, and Dish didn't take them to that next level. Right. What started the convenience store? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story, actually. It, uh, it started in, well, I'm going to take you back to here we were bankrupt, right? I went to the chairman of the company. I said, man, I'm still pretty young. Should I, should I go get another job? And he said, I don't know, I'll, I'll tell you what my daddy told me. It's a classic Texan, right, from Dallas, Texas. His father had started the business. His name was Joe C. Thompson. And his dad started in 1927 with something called the Southland Ice House. What they did is they sold big blocks of ice to people for their ice box. This is before the days of refrigerators, right? In 1928, somebody invented something called a Frigidaire. What's that going to do to your business model when you sell blocks of ice, Screw right? Screw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he told me this story because he said, had we not adapted to the change, had we had our head down, we would have been out of business by 1930. But instead, we asked the customers what they want. They said, this is the, so important. We don't come here for ice. We come here for convenience. Where were we going to get ice in Dallas, Texas before refrigeration? They then said, ah, well, we'll sell other things you need conveniently. And they started selling bread, milk, eggs off of the dock. They already had the ice to keep it cold. Right. That literally led the Southern Corporation into the convenience business, and it became 7-Eleven as we know it today. And now there's 80,000 stores, you said? Now there's 80,000 stores worldwide. Still satisfying convenience. It's not about stores. It's about what you sell and how you sell it. What you want, where you want, when you want it. The convenience store paired with the gas station is like perfect. And you took paying at the pump at the 7-Eleven store? Yeah, it was, it was another one of those convenience items. Gasoline, I, even though I came from the oil business, from Gulf, I looked at it at 7-Eleven. I said, 
you know, yeah, this is a very valuable product, but it's just about convenience. What they were using gasoline for was to force people into the store. And I looked at that model and said, wait a minute, you know, that's not convenient. If I have to go into the store to pay, then why would I go to 7-Eleven? I can just go to a gas station with a full serve or go to another gas station where I can do, you know, um, where, I, where they'll trust me. I don't have to prepay for gasoline, right? And so uh, we literally took a very different strategy to the gasoline at 7-Eleven and said, we're not going to be prepay anymore. And that was right around the time the technology came out for Island Card Readers. And when we put the first Island Card Reader in 7-Eleven, I remember specifically going to a management meeting and the, the senior people standing around the table, one of them pounded the table and said, over my dead body, will you ever put those damn card readers? I want those people coming into my store to pay for their gasoline. Right. But that's not convenient, right? So they had lost sight of the very definition of convenience, which is make it easier for people to get their transaction. That's crazy. Yeah. But you know what it was? Joe, it was a great opportunity. So here I was, the new kid, the gas guy. But that was your insight, too, of like the young, I, I, this is what people I want. A completely different mindset. Yeah. yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't trapped in that model of, of we sell beer, soft drinks, and cigarettes, and so we want those people coming in to buy those things. For me, it was, we'll be fine as long as we keep making it more convenient for people. And that led to personal opportunity for me, too, because we came out of that period. Gas profits went up. Gas margins went up, so we blew away all of the forecast in the LBO. The store business inside went down. We came out of that. They made me head of strategy for 7-Eleven. How old were you at the time? Oh, probably late 20s. Crazy. Early 30s. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nuts. And then what's even crazier is after that, a few years later, they made me chief financial officer. I was not a CPA. I was not a public company CFO. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I had a really good controller and a really good audit partner at PwC. And they kept me out of trouble because this is during the Enron days, right? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Were you friends with many other CEOs and CFOs? I was. I was, I was really very fortunate to uh, leverage the network that's out there. And CEOs, you know, uh, are generally very cooperative in helping other CEOs. I had, I had people, you know, sort of put their arm on, around my shoulder and say, let me, let me help you out here and, you know, give me some coaching and mentoring when I was a newly minted CEO. Yeah. Did you ever get to chat with Warren Buffett? I did. I did. In fact, my visit with Warren came at a really critical time in my career because I had taken on the challenge of Blockbuster. You said, do I like these risky things? Yeah, I knew it was risky, but I, I did it on purpose because I knew the upside was huge if we could crack the code on taking it to digital. But we were right in the middle of that whole financial crisis. And I, I ended up meeting uh, Warren for the first time. I was at an, uh, an, a reception at Bill Gates' home, believe it or not, in Seattle. He threw uh, for Microsoft a thing called the CEO Summit. So I was kind of, you know, starstruck looking around look at all these these are like big time ceos i had just been at 7-eleven i mean it's 7-eleven ceo that's nothing look at these guys these are like real ceos <laughs> these guys like warren buffett or you know bezos or you know the, it was kind of fun anyway i i'm i'm at the line getting food and here's warren buffett standing next to me and <laughs> i shake his hand i introduce him myself introduce myself he's yeah i know i know you know you were at 7-eleven you had a good run what are you doing? And I said, oh, yeah. And I started apologizing. It's like, that blockbuster now, it's not going so well. I'm getting the snot beat out of me and the press is bad. I told him about my, my New York Post interview or uh, photo. And I was like, oh, they, they think blockbuster is going to file for bankruptcy. And I'm trying not to let that happen. I got these great, I've got some great co uh, collaborative partners. I didn't tell them about the Google deal or two or three others I had lined up. But I don't know if I can see it through. And he was great. He said, you know, he said, would you rather be on the sidelines watching this from the bench or would you rather be in the game? I was like, 
yeah, you know what? You're right. I'd rather be in the game. So then just dust yourself off, get back at the plate, and you'll be fine. That's crazy. Yeah, and he was so right. And, and, and he's right in that it wasn't personal. I was beginning to let it affect me and take it personally. It's not personal. It's business. I did my best. Um, the financial times were horrible. But by staying the course and seeing it through, I was able to get the company restructured. We saved 19,000, 20,000 jobs at the time. And uh, we were able to uh, sell the company to Dish Network, who then had a chance to take it to that next level. Were you able to separate your work and your personal life and find that balance? I have horrible work-life balance. All I do is work, but it's fun to me. So, yeah, it's, it's probably not so fun for my family, but <laughs> but I, I have to confess, if I have one bad thing, it's, it's that work-life balance because I love what I do. Yeah. Business is fun. It's a blast if you look at it that way. Who brought 7-Eleven free slurpee day? Was that you? <laughs> You know, the greatest holiday of all time. Yeah, well, in a backwards sort of way. So uh, you want the real backstory there? Yeah, please. All right. So, so uh, <laughs> we had a racing team with uh, Michael Andretti and Mario Andretti. They had Andretti Racing. We were, uh, had a car at Indy. And a, as you know, uh, one of the competitors was Bobby Ray Hall and David Letterman. David Letterman was a, uh, from in, from Indianapolis. Actually, was he a sponsor? From Indiana. On the he car? was a sponsor, uh, not of our car. He had his own racing team. Okay. And so the Ray Hall Letterman race team had a driver named Danica Patrick. She was one of the the first female uh, Indi uh, IndyCar drivers. She was doing great on the circuit. And uh, our team wanted to hire her. So Michael Andretti reached out, and they hired Danica Patrick away from David Letterman. And Bobby Rahal. Well, about two weeks later, I'm watching TV and I'm sitting at home and I'm watching David Letterman, one of my favorite nighttime shows. And all of a sudden, David Letterman introduces Jim Keyes, the CEO of 7-Eleven. And you're not on TV. <laughs> and I'm not on TV. And my wife looks at me and says, uh, who's that? <laughs> and it's some actor that walks out on stage. He says, thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. I'm so excited. I want everybody to know that they can walk into a 7-Eleven store and say, I want my free Slurpee Dave sent me. <laughs> True story. True story. So, of course, we had hundreds of thousands of people going into stores asking for their free Slurpee. Um, we weren't quite prepared for that. Um, it turned out that he then, uh, two weeks later, said, uh, come on into 7-Eleven, have a free hot dog. Say, Dave sent me. <laughs> and the same actor came out over and over. We finally got him to stop using 7-Eleven. <laughs> but they didn't stop the shtick, unfortunately. So they used Jim Keyes, CEO of Sony Pictures, when they had a, some kind of snafu. They had, when Exxon had an oil spill, they had uh, Jim Keyes, CEO of Exxon. CEO of the um, Church of Scientology. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I had 10 years he did this. That's so funny. Oh, it was hysterical. But that was literally uh, not really. The, we had done some free Slurpee on 7-Eleven Day, but that sort of was the uh, inspiration to make it a big regular thing and have appropriately sized cups to be able to offer free Slurpees on 7-Eleven Day. Yeah. My wife and I got married July 11th, and we took our marriage photos as well inside of 7-Eleven drinking the free Slurpees. I love that. It you was know, so fun. You, I can't tell you how many stories I had over the days of, you know, babies that were seven pounds, 11 ounces and, uh, you know, couples that were married or engaged or met at 7-Eleven. It's, 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 it's just a wonderful thing. Not just in the United States either. Yeah. It's all over the world. Right. It, Why did the Apple store work over Radio Shack? You know, that is such a great question. And, and, and it, it was actually, in a backwards way, my inspiration for Blockbuster. You see, when Apple first built their stores, I'm a retailer. I was at 7-Eleven at the time. I was fascinated because they got rid of all that inventory. And it was all in the back room. They just, it was a display store. First right? of its kind. Yeah, yeah. And then they started integrating, you know, the computer with the tv with you know your phone they're doing all this wonderful integration so after leaving 7-eleven i looked at apple 
as the model for convenient access to technology and media entertainment. Well, who was not doing such a good job of delivering access to, to technology and convenient access to entertainment, Blockbuster or Radio Shack? So when I was trying to, when I was looking after 7-Eleven to reemerge in one of these transformative businesses, I first looked at Radio Shack and said, Radio Shack could be the technology agnostic Apple store, right? If they could figure out how to put a person like a little mini genius bar in every Radio Shack and let your Blackberry at the time talk to your HP computer and then have movies that would be downloaded to your TV, you can do everything you could do within that Apple ecosystem, but at a Radio Shack. They were already the largest cell phone retailer in the United States. And think of the timing. Again, Apple had just come out with the iPhone in 2007. And this is now, you know, 2006, 2007-ish. So I thought that Radio Shack could have been a really good play get rid of all the, you know, parts and pieces that they would sell for computer geeks and make it truly a technology agnostic Apple store that carried Samsung phones, Apple phones, you know, HP computers, Blackberries if you wanted them. That was the model. Now, if you think about the possibilities then if you banged Blockbuster together with that, and you had every phone that you sold, whether it was a Samsung or an Apple, come with free movies, Blockbuster On Demand, Blockbuster Total Access, it would have been potentially even better than the Apple Store. Because now you have content, you have convenient access to both hardware and software. That was the big, big dream that we had. And you you wanted to do that at Radio Shack? At Radio Shack and Blockbuster. Now, at that time then, Radio Shack, so I'm on the road. I was out selling to private equity, um, whoever would listen to investors, both models with the idea that we buy one first, transform it, and then acquire the other and integrate it. It was big dream. Um, and maybe a little too ambitious. Sometimes I think a little bit too <laughs> too big. But, but it could have... It could have worked. And so we were on the road selling Blockbuster and Radio Shack. I had two decks in my briefcase. And I pulled out, I was in a a pitch for um, for Radio Shack with an investor. And he said, have you ever thought about doing this for Blockbuster? And I pulled out the Blockbuster deck. That's crazy. (laughs) It was it was an awesome meeting. And he said, I got I to gotta get somebody on the phone. He picked up the phone, called I, Carl Icahn. He said, Carl, you got to talk to this guy. He's got an idea about how to transform Blockbuster and get it into devices so that everybody will, every time they buy a phone, a computer, a TV, will have Blockbuster access to it. You've got to talk to him. And literally 20 minutes later, I find myself in Carl Icahn's office. He was the lead director for Blockbuster at the time. And that's how it, that's how that little journey started. Wow. (sighs) (laughs) We have your book here now. It's coming out February. It is. What can the reader expect from this? So for me, this is a very, very long uh, long journey that I've been on to take all the learnings I had as a kid and uh, to uh, capture them from both life and from business into what would you tell your 17-year-old self, right? Yeah. And what I would tell my 17-year-old self is, first of all, chill. It's going to be okay. You know, there's some great adventure coming. But I'd also provide a roadmap for success because there are some pretty straightforward things. So in the book, I've actually gone through um, what I call the C-suite learnings. And it's in some ways ridiculously simple, but in other ways pretty meaningful because it's how to learn, what to learn, and why to learn. Something that they don't teach us in school. Right. Right? We learn skills. We learn accounting. We learn business. We learn science. No one ever says, here's why algebra is important. The title is called Education is Freedom. 
Do you think that going to college played a huge part in your career? Yeah, massive. Um, and, you know, college is, is getting uh, a lot of criticism these days for a whole host of reasons from both the left and the right. It's kind of interesting to see everybody piling on college. Is it even necessary? Is too expensive? Or, you know, it's, uh, there's all kinds of stories about, you know, indoctrinating our kids and all this stuff, right? I think we're fighting about all the wrong stuff. What's most important is learning and lifelong learning. And college, what college represents, it will change. Technology is going to change secondary and post-secondary education in a huge way, just as it's changed blockbuster in the movie business and just as it's changed automobiles and retailing, et cetera. It will change education. But for now, the reason it's still important is that when you're an entrepreneur or you're in a big company, whatever you're going to be doing, those credentials are your point of differentiation. And that's what helped me along the way. The fact that I had an MBA from Columbia when I was at 7-Eleven helped differentiate me versus other leaders. And that differentiation is no different than a product on the shelf. Why does someone pick Coca-Cola or Pepsi over an unbranded, you know, cola beverage? They have the brand. They know something about what went into that brand. And that's your brand as an employee, as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs to go to the bank, borrow money. It's the first thing they ask for. Give me a background. So it's still very important for, uh, in today's world especially, especially as we go into the information age, right. for, uh, for people to look at college as a serious endeavor. What else do you have coming up now? I know you fly jets. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta have some hobbies, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have your own plane. Yeah, I um, I, I have uh, uh, kind of too many planes, and <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm just one of these aerospace geeks. So I um, like to fly about anything that has wings or rotors on it, and uh, so I fly helicopters, I fly float planes. Um, I've got an old World War II uh, trainer called the T6 Texan. That's a blast to fly, open open canopy, and uh, aerobatic, fully aerobatic, stick and rudder. Open canopy where you have to wear the goggles and you can't hear anything? Uh, well, you can't hear much, but I've got good old uh, Bose uh, noise-canceling headsets that work pretty well in there. But yeah, open canopy, it's like driving around in a convertible at 10,000 feet. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, it's a blast. So are you, a doing, blast. are you just doing consulting now? Uh, I do a lot of advisory work. I do some board work. Um, I do uh, a lot of startups, um, helping people get uh, get started in their uh, in their technology. I'm working on a uh, a rocket startup, believe it or not, uh, out here. A bunch of former SpaceX employees that spun out and decided they want their own uh, rocket company. So I'm doing some consulting, some advisory work with them, and and uh, board work with them. Wow, it's fun. That's cool. Sweet. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming by. Um, where can everyone find you on social media? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, J. Key's author. J. Uh, Key's author. Yeah. J. Key's author on TikTok, on Instagram. Uh, Jim Keys or James Keys on LinkedIn is uh, another way to, uh, to find me. But uh, yeah, I'm out there uh, trying to uh, increase my social media presence so that I can get some awareness for the book. And, you know, my small way, just trying to change the world. I really do think that what you'll find in the book um, is that knowledge is the antidote to so much of the problems that we have in the world today. And if we can increase people's awareness of how important knowledge is, um, I hate to be as, you know, naive as to think I can help advance world peace, but Knowledge really is the antidote to hatred, to under, you know, to violence, to misunderstanding. A cycle of knowledge that leads to understanding, that leads to peace and hope is far better than one that is filled with misunderstanding, fear, which is the culprit in so many of our problems in the world, anger and violence. It's that cycle that we can reverse with knowledge and education. Did you have that philosophy your whole life or is that acquired through your years working? 
I have learned that philosophy over the years um, and have come to truly appreciate the power of education in my life. Um, and as I look at all of the problems that I had in the business world, they're all solvable through knowledge, not just my knowledge, but through an informed workforce. Everything is solvable. And the same applies to society. So most of the issues that we face in society today are caused by the lack of knowledge or understanding, which contributes to fear. And people are playing on fear. So think about wars, think about terrorism, think about crime. So much of it is fear-based. You seem very level-headed with everything. <laughs> Not really. Not really. <laughs> I've got a lot to learn. That's why, that's why I wrote the book. Because yeah. It's all part of the learning process. Is there anything you remembered or found on self-discovery while writing the book? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll share with you a, a formula I've got, which is kind of interesting because I've I've struggled with how can intelligent people do such stupid things in the world, right? I wonder the same thing. Yeah, I, I struggle with that all the time because it's like, come on, we should be beyond conventional warfare, right? In in this in in this day and age, we're still out there blowing each other up with tanks and suicide vests. I mean, come on. Why is that? And I, and, I, and I tried to study it in the course of the book. And I'll give you an equation. It's kind of interesting. Because there's IQ, we all know, right? And that's what basic knowledge is, just intelligence, right? And so you start with intelligence, IQ. And then recently we've heard a lot about EQ, right? The emotional quotient. So the intelligence quotient, the emotional quotient. But I think what's missing today, and this is what I helped to learn about myself in the course of writing the book, is there's also something I call CQ. So IQ plus EQ is knowledge. IQ plus EQ plus CQ, your character quotient, that's where wisdom comes into play. Well, what's character? Integrity. Your humility knowing that you have more to learn. So I sound like a really arrogant know-it-all guy. I have so much more to learn. That's humility. That's real humility. Yeah. Giving back, compassion for others, recognizing we're in this world with other people. It's not just about me. It's about us. That's such a fundamental part of wisdom that separates smart people who have intelligence even smarter people who have knowledge, IQ plus EQ. But too few people, I think, today have all three, which is that element of wisdom that comes from character. Right. That's awesome. Well, I hope, and that's what I'm sharing in the book, to try to advance um, our collective understanding of how important knowledge really is, is the ultimate antidote to so many of the problems we have today. Yeah, I agree. Sick. <laughs> this is so cool. I, I've learned so much, especially just from like studying you and talking with you today. And I really think everybody should go check out Education is Freedom. Do you know the date it's available? Yeah, February 27th. February 27th. Pre-order now, Amazon.com, uh, Barnes & Noble, all of the online bookstores have it for pre-order. Sure would like to have people pre-order it because I want to make the New York Times bestseller list. I Guys, get let's that. do it. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Jim, thanks so much for coming. Joe, thank you. Lightweights, out. Cool. That was great.